Happy Veterans Day and welcome to the final QUTV sports show of the year. I'm Will Connerly. And I'm Shane Holsey. Lots to get to on today's show, including an exclusive interview, some sports happening around campus, and a prediction we were dead wrong on a few mm -hmm. days ago. Yeah, but first, Shane, we're going to talk about women's soccer. And the final scrimmage of the fall occurred last Sunday, and it didn't disappoint. The first goal came when the black team earned a corner kick, and then they scored. Here's a slow-mo view of the second corner. Hannah Warnicke scores the ball, and it's going to be a 1-1 game. The yellow team and the gold team, they went back and forth. But look at the view right here on Hannah Warnicke's header. It was right on the goal, and the whole ball does cross the line. That goal line technology, it's a 1-1 game. But with six minutes to go in the second, Grace Hilbing executes the game winner right there. It proved to be the game winner in a breakaway goal. Gets rewarded with a good finish and composure in the box right there. Take another look as Hilbing beats the goalkeeper. And there you have it. A fall of soccer scrimmages is complete for the women's soccer team. And the sights are set on the 2021 campaign when the Hawks begin the GLVC schedule against Maryville in late February. Quincy University basketball is on the horizon as well, and both teams are in the full swing of things after dealing with some missed time due to COVID-19 complications. On November 27th, both programs will begin their season at Illinois Springfield. The men's team went 500 last year with 14 wins and 14 losses while weathering a storm of injuries. This year's team returns some top talent and some new faces are projected to make an immediate impact on the court. The Hawks look loaded, healthy and ready to fly. This winter, the squad returns leading scorer Tanner Stuckman, who was an all conference performer and earned second team all GLVC honors. Ryan Hellenthal also returns Charles Collier, Victor Kavakovich and Adam Moore. For the women, Jenny Garber is in her 10th season with the Hawks and Q has senior Maddie Spagnola back after being the leading scorer for the team. As a sophomore, she only played two games last year and suffered a season ending injury. Another scorer, Lainey Lance, also returns for her sophomore year after scoring the second most points for a freshman in the GLBC. Marta Rivera, Sarah Nelson also progressed to be to their sophomore campaigns, which will provide more experience for the Hawks. Grace Shavnagel and Alexander Petrovich offer some experience as well in the senior class. In addition to Spagnola, transfer Emma Knipe comes to QU after being an all conference performer at Southeastern Community College and averaging over 18 points a game. And in addition to that, Amanda Porth and Dami Adienka offer depth at the guard position after filling in during Spagnola's absence last year. Every team has experienced the woes that have come with missed time and whatnot with COVID-19. Yeah, but that time has passed for QU Media Zone. Jay Hamill, him and a couple other QU pitchers got together last week and we caught some action of Hamill. He is preparing for that season coming up in March with the bullpen. Him and Owen Barons each threw a nice little session at QU Stadium and the team has concluded their fall. They're prepared uh, to make a deep postseason run. It all begins, like we said, in early March. Hamill through 19 innings last year was in the starting rotation as a sophomore during the Hawks abbreviated spring. The Rendon South Newton alum forecast to play a big role for QU in 2021. The QU football team held its final activities of the fall last week and it was capped off with a competitive scrimmage under the lights at QU Stadium. The team has new members on the coaching staff, a new quarterback to take the field and a unique schedule for the spring of 2021. We have head coach Gary Bass on next segment. We'll highlight the Hawks football fall and look forward to what he expects from the team this spring. We'll also discuss how the coaching and recruiting grind never stops, how these students, student athletes will have, have to have a no breaks mentality as well as they take their finals and head home for an extended break to prepare for the season. Coming up. Are you ready for some football? It's got me feeling some type of way. Will, we'll talk with head honcho Gary Bass when we come back. you for you to do what you love. 
Finding your passion is easy at Quincy University. Whether you're pursuing a bachelor's degree or looking to go even further, at QU, your professional and academic future is bright. 40 undergrad programs include moments that become experiences, connections that become careers, and relationships that become lifelong support. We want you here. That's why we work hard to ensure that a Quincy University education is affordable. Let us help you put together a plan. Visit discover.quincy.edu to get started. So I'm from Chicago, Illinois. I lost my mother and brother at the age of 13, which is so hard for a 13 year old. I never let their death be like a burden to me, but more so of a motivation because anything that I do from now is for them. I brought my GPA back up to where it should be. Myself and other uh, African Americans or blacks, we all feel that oh, the criminal justice system is like rigged against us. And that's also kind of like what motivates me to go into forensic psychology. So I'm a fan of Law and Order, uh, SVU. And with that, it was, that's what kind of like persuaded me or guided me to go into that field. TV Sports this week, and we are pleased once again to welcome into the studio Mr. Gary Bass, head coach of the QU football team. Thank coach, you for having for coming me. On. Always, you always a pleasure. Now, let's talk about last week's scrimmage. Getting the guys in a game like setting, getting to crack mm -hmm. the pads a little bit and get after it, that had to feel good. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's nice to be able to end the semester on that note. I know we usually in our offseason get 15 practices. Uh, we got through 10 this fall. Uh, to just have the ability to put the pads on and actually be able to go live. Uh, to conclude a, a fall season was great. Our kids had a, did a great job in the off season. Uh, we feel like we made a lot of strides, both as a coaching staff with a lot of new faces, uh, new offense and everything, and then also with some new players and some key situations and places. Absolutely. Now, what, what impressed you the most out of what you saw, maybe two or three things that stood out to you during that scrimmage? Uh, probably number one, a competitiveness. Uh, you know, whenever you lose a guy like Andrew Run and some of the receivers and, and, and a couple other guys that we lost in the back end, DT Christian and Keenan Stiegel, you're never really sure uh, with those young guys exactly. Are they going to be uh, filling it out? How are they going to be from a competitive standpoint? So I definitely think the number one thing was the competitive streak. Uh, number two was for us to be able to pick up what we were able to pick up of our offense. Uh, we still got a long way to go offensively with a new offense getting put in in 10 practices. But for us to be able to make the strides we did offensively, I think that was huge. So I'd say those are definitely the two biggest things. Absolutely. All great things to see. Now, shifting gears a little mm -hmm. bit, you were recently featured in the Quincy Herald Wigs 20 <laughs> under 40 series. If yes, I am under 40, believe it or not, without all the gray hair. <laughs> if you haven't gotten a chance to check it out, I highly recommend it. Great series. Now, just briefly just kind of talk about what that was like and what it means to, to be a part of that series. Well, the funny thing is I, I get a phone call about it probably two months ago and I thought it was a joke. I thought someone was messing with me. I didn't really know a whole lot about it. Uh, I know some people had talked to me about it before, um, but then whenever it came out and I got called about it, I kind of thought someone was pulling, pulling a prank on me or something. But I mean, it was really awesome to see uh, that people recognize what we're trying to do. I told our players, I told our coaches, it's not an award for me, it's an award for our program, it's an award for them, uh, it's an award for this university and what we're trying to accomplish. So yeah, my name's on it, but as far as I'm concerned, it's QU football and the university. And one topic of conversation in that article was how you kind of balance everything. As a football coach, you're working 60, 70 hour days a week sometimes during a football season, so that, that balancing act can be tough. So for those who aren't privy to that, information how do you balance how do you perform that kind of balancing act i have the greatest wife on the planet one uh i think when me and her got married knowing the profession i'm in her being as independent as she is is awesome because she knows how much i care about what i do in my profession and and you know the cool thing is my two children do as well i mean to have lila and have jackson and have her around uh, as much as i can uh, I think is huge because, I mean, unfortunately, we, we live in a society now where there's a lot of parents that aren't together. And I know there's a lot of our guys that it's good for them to see me be a father, see me be a husband and see that, hey, you know what? You can have a career. Uh, you can still be a good family man and, and still be able to have fun, too. So it's, it's very interesting. It's not easy, but we get it done. It's always awesome to have that. We talk about teams having a supporting cast. You have a great supporting cast of your own. And Another thing that you talked about in that article was who has influenced you the most. You mentioned two people, your father mm -hmm. and your high school football coach. Just kind of elaborate on that, how they kind of helped you. Well, I definitely think my father would be number one. Me and him are really close. We talk all the time, uh, even now. 
Uh, probably talked to him two or three times. In fact, usually I talk to him in the morning whenever I come on come into work. So, uh, I mean, he instilled that work ethic, that mentality, um, the core values that I live live by as a, as a coach, and everything that we're about as a program was huge. Um, my faith is all because of him. Me being the type of family man I am, I am is because of him. My success in football in a lot of rights has been because of him um, him getting me started in it. Um, but I, I can't thank him enough for that. Um, outside of that, my offensive line coach from high school, Carson Gowan, uh, was unbelievable. Just instilling the work ethic, the mental toughness, the things that were going to take place. Because I'll be honest with you, when I was a, a freshman in, in high school, I remember trying to quit and I remember him looking at me going, I know I'm not letting it happen. And it's funny because had he just allowed me to do this and, and just not continued, I wouldn't be sitting here right now. So I have a lot to, to thank him for from that standpoint. Absolutely. And you also mentioned your first coaching job out of college, coaching for McDowell High School mm -hmm. in North Carolina. And you mentioned how that kind of helped you develop your coaching philosophy, mm -hmm. if you will. So what is your coaching philosophy? How did that come about? I think first and foremost, I think people, I use this adage all the time, people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. Uh, as an individual, you have to prove to people that you truly care about them more than just as a football player. Um, when we talk about it as coaching staff, first and foremost, the most important thing is we're father figures. We're, we're male role models for our football team and for our players and anyone else that's around us. So I think having the opportunity to go back and work with my high school uh, football coach and all the guys that I respected growing up uh, definitely put a different perspective in my mind of exactly what coaching was about. And it wasn't just about the X's and O's. It wasn't just about lifting. It wasn't just about this. It was about developing um, a young man to be a better person as he gets older. So I think, unfortunately, sometimes people take that and they think you just, you don't care as much about the sport when you truly care about the entire human. And I think, unfortunately, that couldn't be further from the truth. I want to win. I want to win a lot of games, but I want to do it the right way. And developing those relationships mm -hmm. is what, what helps do that. And this has come up in our conversations in the past. That's already come up to a great extent here today and something that's near and dear to your heart, possibly even more than football, mm -hmm. you already talked about it, is your family, mm -hmm. Melanie, Lila, Jackson. How do they keep you going and just keep, help you mold you into the person and father that you are? <laughs> well, it's my wife, like I said earlier, she is one of the most independent people I've ever met. She's one of the toughest, hardest working individuals I've ever seen. And I think her and I's differences, the way we grew up with our family structure has helped drastically us be able to see how important it is to be there for the young men on our football team and for her to be a mother for a lot of those guys if while they're here. I think for Jackson and for Lila, Lila loves it because she thinks she has 120 plus big brothers um, right now. So I mean, for her to, to be able to have that experience and be around people and uh, to be able to see that, you know what, sweetheart, it's about our family and it's about everything we want to do, but our family is not just us. Our family is everybody within our football program and in this university. And it's when she comes here on campus, she she acts like she owns it. <laughs> uh, Coach Lepke, the, the piano down in the cafeteria area, uh, Lila gets on it, even though she has no idea how to play it. And she definitely thinks that things makes things more interesting. So to be able to have the ability to to let her see me beyond just being a father, but being a coach and everything else, I think is huge. And them opening their hearts and, and, and everything for our young men in our program is huge as well. And I, I know she loves going to practice. I've seen her at oh, countless practices. She wants a whistle. She wants everything. She wants to run it. She thinks she is in charge when she's there. I, I think you've got, a, got an assistant coach on your hands. Yeah, it's going to be like the little girl from Remember the Titans. She's going to be pacing back and forth in the stands whenever she gets older, so it'll be funny. Uh, speaking of the Titans and also things that are near and dear to your heart, mm -hmm. your Tennessee Titans, big win on Sunday dominating fashion it was 24 17 but it really wasn't that close they dominated in all aspects well the bears aren't very good on offense so think, when, when you're not very good on offense uh and tennessee does what they what they do with the ball control Tanhill didn't play great but he did enough they made enough plays and their defense played really really well and a lot of rights with the turnovers and stuff so anytime you can get an opportunity to do that it gives you a chance to, to be successful so very happy whether those guys stand after a couple game losing streak well hopefully they can keep things rolling big matchup coming up this week thursday night football battle for first place in the division should be a fun one against the colts and what also should be fun is what's coming up next. It's quiz time. Uh -oh. This time with head coach Gary Bass. I, I, you think he's ready? I guess we'll find out. Stay with us. Gary, quickly, it's um, exercise science, human performance, and 
basically that is going to set me up to get certified um, in strength and conditioning uh, and personal training. So ultimately what I want to do after college is put my personal training career off to the side and um, join the military. For this upcoming summer I have the opportunity to join uh, the platoon leaders course and basically what this is, is uh, for the Marine Corps, it is Officer Candidate School. Um, it's a 10-week program in uh, Quantico, Virginia. And if I get accepted, I will uh, leave on June 1st and I will train there for 10 weeks up until August 10th. My initial uh, physical standards, and that consists of a three-mile timed run, uh, two minutes to perform as many uh, pull-ups as I can, and two minutes to perform as many sit-ups as I can. on QU TV Sports this week. Shane Holsey, QU head coach, Gary Bass. Now, coach, put on your thinking cap. Oh boy, I'm in trouble. Quiz time. Coach Samuel Thomas of women's soccer got one and a half points last week. We were kind of generous. We could have, he could have had one, but we were a little generous to him. So I think he can beat that Put mark. me on the spot. We'll see what happens. All righty, let's get it rolling. While you're a coach at Missouri Southern State, the offense broke three school records, including the most points in a single game. How many points was that? 72. Very close. 71. 68. Ah, no! That was Lincoln, I think. I think it was at Lincoln. Southwest, Southwest Baptist. Baptist. October 22nd, 2012. Outscored them 35-7 in the second, second half. half. Yep. I remember that one. All righty. Question two. Will you think we can give that to him? All right, we'll, we'll give him half a point for that one. Half a point within four. Half a yeah. point. <laughs> in a 2014 game against... Southwest Baptist again. QU running back Chris Harris set school and conference records for yards and touchdowns in a game. He had one heck of a season. How many yards and touchdowns? Did Six he touchdowns. Have? 275 yards rushing, I think. 218 yards, seven touchdowns. Oh, I think he had seven. I thought he only had six. Seven. Seven. He was. This is a shame. I should know this. <laughs> I'm messing all these up. You're lowballing them. I am. <laughs> Is GLVC freshman of the year, almost 1,000 yards on the ground, 17 touchdowns. Yeah, year. broke the school record for one, touchdowns in a season. One heck of a season. So you got half a point. We can get things, let's get things back on the right track here. So your alma mater, Catawba College, holds the oh distinction boy. of winning the first and second installments of this collegiate bowl game. What bowl game am I speaking of? I'm wanting to think they beat a big time division one. I'm, this isn't right. I'm, tangerine Bowl? Yes, it, it was called the Tangerine Bowl. It is the Citrus Bowl Citrus now. Citrus Bowl so now. That is correct. I remember that because we, there's, there's a thing in our Catawba that has that down. I'm going to think they beat somebody. It wasn't Clemson, but it was. They beat in the first ever Tangerine It was called the Tangerine Bowl, now the Citrus Bowl. In 1947, they beat Maryville College of Tennessee 31-6. In 1947, the New Year's Day 1948, they beat Marshall. Oh, that's seven to nothing. So you already matched one and a half. Here we go. So got two questions left. Question number four in 2009, Chris Johnson, you know, Chris Johnson, mm -hmm. the former running back for the Tennessee Titans, broke the record for most yards from scrimmage in a single season with 2,509. Whose record did he break? And I'll give you a bonus if you can tell me who's third. Oh, whose record did he break? Um, in a single season, I'm going to go with Eric Dickerson. It's the right team, not the right player. Walter Payton. 
Marshall Falk. Marshall Falk lead? Yeah, I would have never got that one. 2,429 yards from scrimmage. Can you tell me who's third? Oh, God, it's got to be Adrian Peterson or Emmitt Smith. Take a wild guess. Probably wrong again. Christian McCaffrey. Last year. Oh, yeah, I would have never. I don't, I, yeah, I would have not gotten it <laughs> if it's anybody recent. 2,392 yards. Now, if you can pull this one out, I will be very impressed. As I was trying to come up with some questions, of course, your last name's Bass, and as I was fishing for some questions, ah! I reeled this large one Large mouth in. variety. So what is the world record for heaviest large mouth bass ever caught? Oh, God. The heaviest? The heaviest ever. This is probably going to be so off, it's unbelievable. <laughs> um, 57 and a half pounds. Uh, Little, That's little high, too high. Little it's probably high. like 38. 22 pounds, four ounces. Yeah, you're, I'm like you're, you're not optimistic. Even close. Yeah. <laughs> so no I'm chance. Like, like I'm like not even close. You got to deduct <laughs> points for that one. <laughs> we'll keep, we'll keep you at one half. No, no deducting points here. So a man named George Perry, 1932. This was in southern Georgia. And actually, fun fact: the heaviest largemouth bass ever caught in North Carolina. Take a wild guess as to how heavy that was. 17 and a half. Very close, 15 pounds, 14 ounces. So one and a half, those weren't easy oh, questions. No, I should have got all the ones about us. Hey. That's awful. Hey, that's all I'm right. sorry, Chris. <laughs> <laughs> well, Coach, always a pleasure. Thanks for coming on, that was, that was a blast. Thank you guys for having me. Absolutely, well, we're less than 24 hours from the Masters. You looking forward to that? Oh, I love golf. I'm oh. a huge golf fan. Well, we'll preview that when we come up. We'll talk about that and much more on QTV Sports this week. Stay right with us. is a cancer doctor and MRI is a magnetic resonance imaging. Neuroblastoma is a cancer that mostly affects kids. Do the kids in your grade know these words? Probably not. Why do you? I was diagnosed with acute lymphoplastic leukemia, but I don't have cancer anymore and so... Wait a minute, are you cancer free? Yeah. Serving the nation's poor and vulnerable regardless of faith and advocating on their behalf, we are Catholic Charities. Want to take a quick moment to highlight some news on campus this week. Francis Hall was closed after flooding from a broken sprinkler. Water damaged the central part of all four floors, even getting into the basement. Students are allowed back in, but repair work will take several weeks. The Masters will look a little bit different this year. Not only is it November instead of April, but there will be no patrons in attendance, which means we won't hear the roars we're used to hearing. Several of the world's best, including reigning champion Tiger Woods, spoke about the different feel to this year's tournament. It's not how I, I wanted to retain the, the jacket for this long. Um, Obviously, that this has been an unprecedented circumstance we're all dealing with, and uh, it's been incredible to, to have the 
have the jacket and to, to have it, you know, around the house and then uh, to share with, with, with people. Um, but to have it this long, um, it's, it's not the way I, I want to have it. You know, I wanted to you know, earn it back in, in April, but obviously we, we didn't have that. But we have an opportunity to play this week, which, you know, early in the year, we didn't think we'd have this opportunity. So uh, we're all very fortunate to be able to, be able to compete. Uh, and, you know, tonight and, well, this whole day is awfully special because it, I may never have the opportunity to take the jacket off property again. I've always liked sort of doing my own thing and trying to stay as low-key as possible. You know, sometimes the way I've played over the years, it, you know, I haven't, you know, that hasn't happened because, you know, I've won some tournaments and, you know, I, I've, you know, I've, I've been on some pretty good runs at times. Um, but yeah, I don't mind this. This is, this is nice. It's, you know, it feels like everything this year, it's more subdued. It's more relaxed. It's sort of just, that's what, that's the feel for me anyway. Just the fans. <laughs> it's, um, it's, I've played it twice i think on the sunday before where there's there's nobody here um maybe in like 18 or 17 something like that and it's weird because you can see almost every hole when you're standing on one tee you can just look out and see everything and um you're not used to that i thought it was weird at the time and then you know you get there now on the first tee and you can see everything you're not going to hear the roars that you're used to hearing um so that'll be That'll be quite different, but at the same time, there's plenty of leaderboards out there. You can figure out what's going on. It's just, I, I think that's what makes this place so exciting is to hear those roars. And when you hear them, it doesn't matter where you are on the golf course. You almost can tell by the roar who the player is, who or what they did, and, and what it's coming from, which I think is pretty unique. This is the Masters, and... It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if it rains. It doesn't matter if it shines. We get to compete for a green jacket. As a player, that's all we care about. And I'm just thankful that we have that chance this year because it was, it's was it been very challenging, a lot of extra work to put this tournament on. And I appreciate, I'm appreciative of the club doing this for us. Tournament gets underway Thursday morning. ESPN will have the coverage of the first two rounds Thursday and Friday afternoons. Beginning noon central and CBS will handle the Saturday the Saturday and Sunday coverage at noon on Saturday at 9 a.m. on Sunday. Shane, I know you're a pretty big golf guy. Love the Masters. Love the yeah, Masters. Yeah, you do. So who's going to don that green jacket this well, weekend? Well, these, these predictions are always almost virtually impossible with, with these kind of tournaments. The field is just, it's just so deep. And I just, I'll give, you, I'll give you four guys who I think, Will be if I picked a fantasy team, say for the Masters, these would be my four guys. Bryson DeChambeau hits the ball a country mile. John Rahm, Dustin Johnson, you know their epic battle they had earlier this year. They're always a lot of fun. And my, I, this might be the guy I picked to win it. Colin Morikawa mm. is playing some of the best golf in the world, probably the best iron player in the world. Okay. And then some four, four sleepers I got for you. The first one's Terrell Hatton. He's been playing some great golf this year. Always shows up in these big time majors. Tommy Fleetwood does as well. Louis Oost stays in the South African. And Scotty Scheffler shot a 59 earlier this year. He, sh he should be a fun one to watch. And not many people know who he is, but maybe they will after this weekend. And we know how our predictions have, have gone on this show, so I figured I'd throw eight names out there. Hopefully, hopefully, hopefully one of them sticks yeah. on the board. Just throw them all on the wall, <laughs> see what sticks. But you've seen how our predictions have gone in the past. You just got Shane's. Well, next segment, we'll show you how both of our picks went completely wrong, and we'll close up shop here on QUTV Sports.
Taught him how to hit a baseball. How to hit a receiver. The strike zone. The net. You taught him how to hit the upper corner. You even taught him how to hit the open man. But how much time have you spent teaching him what not to hit? On last week's show, we previewed what we and many others in the sports media world thought would be one of the games of the year. Two of the GOATs, Tom Brady and Drew Brees, going at it in Tampa. We both like Brady's Buccaneers to get the better of Brees at Saints, and boy, were we wrong. The Saints utterly dominated Tampa Bay and crushed them 38-3. to 31 of those points came in the first half. This was over in the second quarter. Brees threw for 222 yards, four touchdowns, and the Saints intercepted Brady three times, but more importantly, the Saints took first place in the NFC South and are now the one seed in the NFC playoffs as things currently stand. And with those four touchdowns, Breeze regained the all-time touchdowns lead with 564 TDs to Brady's 561. While Will's good buddy, or someone he's a big fan of, Tom Brady, took a big time out over the weekend, he took a page out of one of his former NBA stars books over the weekend. After LeBron James won his fourth NBA title earlier this year, he sat down with his teammate Anthony Davis and reporter Rachel Nichols. Nichols asked AD if LeBron was the GOAT. Here's LBJ's response. Final MVP. Four, four championships. Don't four championships. How many final MVPs? Four. Don't gas me. Don't gas me. <laughs> <laughs> Born NBA star concluded the question by saying he's different, but someone that was a part of the broadcast team this weekend replicated some of those feelings as well. Take a listen. With Smith in the press box, he's now on the camera for the stream work, so if you have any compliments for him, you can also drop those below. But as he says, don't gas me. So don't. he doesn't want too many compliments. He's a humble man. Wow, Shane. I mean, all I got to say is one thing I will gas is my fantasy team oh, being Lord. superior to yours uh, this past week. Hey, hey, you, you've gotten the better of me twice this year. St. Louis Steamers are having a rough go of things, but still in the playoff hunt, still in playoff contention, still uh, vying for some, some postseason fantasy football, if you will. But yeah, it's been a rough go of things, but we'll see how the rest of the season goes. We will see, but this season of QTV Sports, unfortunately, has come to a conclusion. Thank you to everybody in the control room working with us. It's been so fun. And also our instructors, our viewers, everybody who's played a part in this show, we thank you very much, and we'll definitely be back in 2021. For Will, I'm Shane. For the last time in 2020, take care, stay safe, and happy Veterans Day. If you see a veteran, please do thank them. It will mean a lot to them. So. For Will, I'm Shane once again. For the last time in 2020, take care, stay safe. We'll see you in 2021.